Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M and T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank. Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization. Hello, my name is Michael Stoll, host of the Stoller Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. I hate to say, but we're really in a major credit crisis. Um, hopefully, the Senate, the House, somebody's going to sign a bill. We really don't know what's going to happen. But there, there still has to be some money for real estate. Not too much, under certain rules and regulations. But today, I've assembled four leaders from the insurance companies to tell us their perspective of the market today and what's going on. My guests include Chris Van Aken, director at Aegon, uh, Scott Chisholm, managing director at Prudential, Nick Yankee, uh, director, okay, director at Northwest, uh, Northwest Mutual Life Insurance. And last but not least, who takes care of most of the pensions of all the teachers and of CUNY TV, uh, Rick Capola, managing director of TIA CREF. So, since my people at CUNY want to know, what are you investing? I mean, you, you have a lot of money there, uh, and you, you represent the investments of a lot of um, ed educators, hospitals, and everything. What are you doing these days? Well, I, obviously, it's been a pretty interesting year, and, and it's been pretty fluid. But right now, what we're focused on are really the core markets, best borrowers, long-term relationships that we've had. Um, and we're doing very conservative loans because we're, um, that's what we can do, frankly. So, so who are, who, you know, who are the best borrowers? What, I mean, let's, you know, we're, we're in the tri-state region. Who would be the type of people who you'd like to lend to? It's, um, it's a combination of things. It's the institutional borrowers. It's uh, some of the large public companies, the Boston Properties of the World, the Shorensteins, public or private companies, or the families, you know, the, the Lafracs, the Rudins. It's... It doesn't get much better than that. So, you know, those people who have deep pockets, mm -hmm. who are well experienced. Now, now, you, I know you've lent money all over New York, not always to the most established, but to good people. Mm -hmm. Where, where's Northwest? Nick is also a returnee from last year. Where, where's Northwest in today? You know, I like to say we're where we've always been. We've always looked for very good borrowers, meaning good net worth, good knowledge and experience. We've always looked for good assets in whatever category, retail, office, et cetera, apartments. Uh, and we're in the same place. I don't think we've really changed much. It's just that we're seeing more of those opportunities than we ever have. But my, my question, and we were saying this prior to the show, because we're going to air it just in a couple of days. Right now, you're temporarily keeping to the side, right? I would say over the last couple of weeks, we've been watching the, the credit markets and the financial markets. Treasury yields are bouncing up and down. Everything's bouncing. We're waiting for some, some calm or stability uh, in this sea of turmoil. And, uh, uh, but we have lots of deals that we're looking at. And the second issue is that pricing is very difficult. There's, there's very little data, I believe, out there. 
uh, to actually set pricing. Uh, we talk amongst ourselves, et cetera, but pricing is all over the board, and that needs to, we need to determine what that is so we can price some of these diesels. And I want well. you to be that way, because as I was saying, I'm a, I'm a policyholder for Northwestern for 30 years, and it's the best investment. If I kept every dollar in there, I would have done eight times better than the stock market. The quiet company is perfect. Now, Prudential is a pretty good company. What's Prudential doing these days? Well, Michael, our strategy in the commercial mortgage uh, marketplace is to really have multiple capital sources uh, that we provide, uh, you know, financing for the industry, the real estate industry. We have, uh, last year we did about 14 and a half billion of lending. Uh, half of that was our life company general account approximately. There's about uh, a third that was roughly for CMBS lending, which we are, you know, we've discontinued and that market's, you know, largely dormant, uh, essentially dormant. Uh, we're an active uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac lender, and we have a balance sheet uh, program as well that we, we typically um, park deals for you know uh, interim periods. Uh, this year, uh, volume has been down uh, somewhat, uh, probably totaling seven billion, I think, across our different various capital sources. Uh, on the life company portfolio, which I think is probably most relevant for this conversation, we. Uh, we haven't really been pricing the last week or so, like uh, others here on the panel. It's been difficult to get a, a feel for what the right pricing is, but we believe that uh, it's important to remain in the market and to remain in the market next year. We think it's a good environment, an advantageous environment to deploy capital into commercial mortgages, which still represent a, an attractive alternative to you know, alternative fixed income uh, types of investments. So uh, we continue to look at deals, and there's, there's interest and there's appetite to do, to do deals. Chris, you know, not a lot of people. What is Aegon? Aegon is a Dutch insurance company. Uh, we have in the U.S., in the USA, we have about a $16 billion portfolio that we hold on our books. So we have a big book of business that we like to keep our existing borrowers in good standing and, and make loans to them. And this is a little bit of a, a troubled time. We like to, we're talking about best borrowers, and those are some of our existing borrowers, low leverage type borrowers. So, so you know, wh what, what would you do? Okay, you know, I realize, and this is a tough question, because pricing is difficult, nobody knows where the market is, nobody knows where this, uh, th this act stands and all the rest. If somebody came to close on a loan in maybe six months, what do you really like, Nick, and what do you really things like you don't like. I know you don't like hotel loans, and you don't like condos. And we traditionally haven't done hotel loans, uh, actually, for about the last 20 years. We'll look at hotels with, with fabulous operating history, and for some reason they're unique, and I hesitate to say monopolistic, but there are these hotels that just outperform even in difficult times. Uh, so we'll take a look at those. Uh, condominiums are too short term for us. It's just a short term uh, lending business and we need to deploy our money for 10 years or greater typically. That's ideally what we try to do. But I would say for Manhattan, uh, you know, we've always liked apartment loans and, and there aren't that many market rate loans in apartments because there's a lot of bond and agency funding on that. Uh, but we like apartments. Uh, uh, we like retail in certain areas. I think I've mentioned you know, we have the uh, the loans on uh, Staten Island Mall and Queen Center, and they have great performing properties. And I think they'll continue to do uh, well. I think the Queen Center is the most highest uh, volume. It's probably per square foot in the in the probably in top America. five in the United top, States. Top five yeah. in and I think they're just stabilizing. So those have done well. We like stable real estate, but obviously in the real estate in the retail world, um, we'll have to be careful going forward based on tenancies and credits and things of that nature. You know, but you bring up a good point on the retail world. You know. Uh, the retail world today with gas, with the economy and everything else. How's, what's your thought about these outlet centers? I mean, they were very large. Tanger is a very large operator. You know, they're doing deals. But do you think you would, enter, and this is for anyone, would you, would you entertain looking at a new long-term loan on, on an on a outlet center? I would say for TIA Craft, that's probably not at the top of our of our uh, focus. Um, we started the year saying, with the softening economy, there there are really two prongs to our retail strategy. One would be needs based retail, grocer anchored centers, um, and we've executed on that during the year. People always have to go and uh, and buy food, and we're but we're looking in established neighborhoods, not you know the next subdivision that's being built in you know outside of Phoenix. Um, and then the other the other effort is really dominant regional malls. I mean, that's always proven to be a, a very uh, bulletproof asset class for us. What about you, Scott? 
On the retail side, uh, again, we're focusing on the dominant grocer anchored centers. Uh, big box retail isn't really on the top of the list for us either, although at the right leverage le level and the right location, uh, we'd, we'd take a look at it. And we've also done some, some larger uh, mall deals this year as well, uh, where we've seen some good you know, relative uh, yield plays. Uh, I think, generally speaking, we're looking for primary market locations and uh, better borrowers, better assets, so investment grade So outlets loan. which are on the sub suburbs would probably not really be there? Probably not, but you know, for the right deal, yeah, uh, the right, right leverage level. Yeah. Chris? We've actually done some portfolios of retail, so you get the geographic diversity and the tenant diversity, and we still like tenants like Walgreens, which has the good credit rating. So mm -hmm. as you go down in credit, I think we're, we're a little leery on, on retail. You know, right now. you know, Nick brought up something about competing with the agencies. For my, uh, for my audience, the agencies are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who, who really, as everyone knows, deserve to be put in jail, every one of their executives. I don't care what happens. I mean, here's a situation. You're, you're a Fannie Mae and Fa Freddie Mac lender. Right. Uh, we were a Fannie Mae dust lender and a Freddie affordable lender. Yes. Okay, so you, so you're a lender for those markets. Today, most people I know would prefer to do business with anyone, and including you, as the Prudential, on your balance sheet as opposed to Fannie and Freddie Mac, because no ha no one has an idea of what's going to happen with the government. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, that's not entirely true, Michael. I mean, this year uh, the the multi family parts of uh, Freddie Mac, or excuse me, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are very large organizations. And in fact, uh, on the multifamily side, uh, the multi the uh, multifamily component of their business is more active by a factor of four than it ever has been. Uh, they're having their biggest year ever. Uh, and, and more people are going to Fannie Mae uh, and I, Freddie Mac for I, loans I, than I, ever I'm before. I'm not disagreeing, but if I'm reading the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac rules, and I've done a show earlier this season, and I've done some panels, Fannie and Freddie are supposed to do residential. That was the major component. Unfortunately, they went into the multifamily, which are good business because mm -hmm. we heard everybody would like to be in it. Well, it's about you know providing uh, affordability, housing affordability in the United States. And so, in some ways, the multifamily business is actually helping them towards those affordability targets. And uh, you know they've been stalwart supporters, supporters of the uh, or providers of liquidity really over the last uh, six months or so. And I can tell you that the you know, the, the terms they're financing right now are very attractive compared to where you can do with a, a balance sheet or portfolio lender. So it, they compare favorably and uh, you know they haven't stopped quoting and doing deals and if you look at the pricing you know even today uh, that you can get from a, on a Fannie Mae execution is you know, superior to what you can get uh, from a... As, as we said before uh, my organization had the choice recently of doing Fannie or a bank and we said I, we, we, we like the bank because we know the bank is strong and the bank is in the business. And I think most people I know in today's market mm. maybe uh, would say, I'll, let, I'll borrow from any of you here on your balance sheet because you've been in business for many years, you're over there, and I'm worried about what's going to happen with the new government rules. Nobody knows. It's open game. Right? Mm. Yeah, I would think uh, the other thing that's coming into play a bit is I think people are seeing some of the institutions that uh, are, have been under stress and, and may be leaving, may have left the uh, industry, and they're saying, well, maybe it's great to do Fannie and Freddie business, but maybe I need some other lenders as well just to kind of diversify their risk. So um, we're actually getting more calls than ever before on stabilized properties, uh -huh. and I think the the uh, underwriting and the pricing has uh, gap has converged a bit between what what I can offer as on a loan as well as what compa as compared to what the uh, the agencies can offer. And, There's and still a gap, but, and but it's we look at it, when we see an apartment deal, we'll look at it for for both capital sources. And uh, clearly, there's lots of flexibility and and uh, benefits of going with a portfolio lender in terms of prepayment optionality, in terms of the the length of the the mortgage, uh, and the other terms, uh, in terms of you know pure. Uh, pricing and proceeds, I think that the agencies still have an advantage uh, you know, for, for those borrowers looking for those. And, and right now, when there's such sparse liquidity in the marketplace, it's, it's good to have those alternatives for borrowers. You know, uh, prior to the show, I was reading this uh, analysis that I told you about from ING Clarion, talking about the projected unemployment in New York of close to 180,000 by the 2010. Um, that unemployment is going to have a specific effect on the amount of office space. In lower Manhattan, AIG and Merrill Lynch 
occupies 6.5 million square feet of office space down there just in lower Manhattan. If someone came to you today, how would you look at an office loan in this market? I would tell you that we're, we're focused more in Midtown right now. We, we are looking at some opportunities, but again, it, it's, it's at a very conservative basis. What, what's a conservative basis? <laughs> yeah, that's tough. It's a moving target. You know, I would have said, is, it, was, is it, I would have said it was 65% leverage level, and it seems to be drifting in, in from that, because we're just building in perhaps a decline in value over time. Nick? A similar answer. We, um, we've always focused on Midtown to a large extent, to some extent Midtown South, depending upon the specific property, but we've always focused on Midtown A buildings and, and in Manhattan, the trophy buildings, as we like to say. And typically they're family owned, high net worth families, minimal leverage, minimal debt. These are families that have survived many cycles because they understand that leverage can be difficult in times like this uh, or institutionally owned. So we've, we've focused on those buildings. We have never really uh, focused on lower Manhattan even during the best of times because we remember cycles like this and what happens in lower Manhattan typically it's very very financially oriented and as we're reading now uh, anywhere from I read 40 to 70 thousand now that today it's up to the number you mentioned in terms of job loss lower Manhattan is directly related and then ironically the rents never get high enough in lower Manhattan so that during the worst of times oftentimes rent goes under what it costs to operate the building and pay the taxes. So it becomes a very difficult situation. We saw that in the early 90s. Uh, so basically the buildings are valueless if, if you look at it in theory. So and I'm talking about a lot of the very old buildings. Right, there's, there's a lot of new buildings on, on the East River and on the Hudson that this doesn't apply to. But it's just an area that, other than a very unique to, circumstance. To complement the Northwest, you've made some great investments in lower Manhattan but in Battery Park City. And but they've been residential, they've primarily, been residential. Yes, which we're still very, very, uh, we think is very, very strong in New York. It, it will suffer a little bit. We can get into that, but uh, we've always thought it's But, you know, now, now I mean, Scott, your office is in Manhattan, but your headquarters are still in Newark? That's correct. Uh, we, and we used to have quite a bit of space downtown as well. Um, and we've been very active in the uh, Manhattan office lending market in the last, over the last couple of years, both on A product and, and B product. A couple of changes for 2008, maybe looking forward, is that we're not really looking to take down large transactions ourselves. Uh, you know, we'll, maybe we'll co-invest with another portfolio lender. Uh, li like the others, we're not looking to really have a high basis in the deal. We'll look at the price per pound and like to be in there at a very conservative le level. Um, right now, we don't really want to take up a lot of lease up risk or construction risk. Uh, so again, we're focusing on the uh, multi-generational. Uh, so, so now, so now I'm going to go into a place called Newark. Right. So what do you think about the office market in Newark? It's, uh, it's a mixed bag, like anything else. I think what we're seeing across many markets is a stratification between asset quality and location. So the, you know, the Class A properties, which were you know, kind of grouped together, the Class B properties have really separated a bit. Right. I mean, look, the gateway is the Class A in Newark. Sure. Uh, and all the rest is the Class B. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting, a couple of months ago, um, Somebody came to me about the Verizon building in Newark, and they were buying it for like thirty-nine dollars a foot. I mean, how could you? You know, it was, it was so cheap, but no one would lend on it because, first of all, Verizon was moving out. <coughs> you know, it was not in the. It was, it was a Class B building, even though it was converted. Um, Chris, what about you in office spaces? Well, we, we haven't done a lot in Manhattan. We do have a, a large portfolio of existing mortgages. We did a a mortgage on, on 3rd Avenue, like more like a 50% loan to value, and just recently downtown, one of the big trophy office buildings, we took a piece of that mortgage. Um, and we just look at what's happening now with the job losses and then the extension of the, the you know, the, the time that it's going to take to build the World Trade Centers. So that, in a negative, is a positive for, for our collateral. Uh, we, we, we got a little bit to Newark. You know, Brooklyn. Lots of things happen in Brooklyn. Northwestern, wouldn't, would you do loans in Brooklyn? We'd certainly look at them. I can tell you it's not a, it's not a um, borough or a submarket that we focused on intently. We did start to really focus on residential, but then you saw so much of it being for sale condominium product. Uh, but we would certainly look at it. We've looked at it over the years certainly for retail. There's attractive retail in all the boroughs because typically they've been under-retailed uh, relative to the nation. So yes, we would. 
What about you, Riff? Uh, we've actually been pretty active in downtown Brooklyn with, with Forest City Ratner, and we had uh, had quite a few loans on those buildings. On uh, Metrotech or Metro on the retail? Metrotech. Um, and, and actually the retail as well. Um, so absolutely we would look. What about the residential today? Um, we haven't done that to date. We, we've looked, I think right now, we'd probably be a little bit cautious. Chris? Uh, we, we haven't done stuff in uh, Brooklyn, but in the Bronx, we, we did some retail uh, right near Co-op City, which right. is a very infill area, and we feel uh, You know, retail, about retail that. in the five boroughs is, is really good because it's so under-retailed, mm -hmm. and, and the, the problem is expansion of whatever you can get, and really anything that's near housing or the subways or transportation in the boroughs are good. The big, big pro. What, what about Brooklyn? Well, we've uh, we've been pretty active over the years. So we've done a couple deals in, in Metro Tech, uh, and uh, I, you know, I like uh, the boroughs. We've we've been very active uh, on the residential side with, uh, you know, with Apollo. Actually, we, we closed a portfolio of rent stabilized apartments earlier this year. Um, you know, Brooklyn office again. We don't see a whole lot of it, but it's something we, we would take a look at at the right price point. We would be interested, um, and I think that you know, residential and retail properties. In the boroughs are, are always an attractive uh, you know, option. What about you know? Everybody was running to Jersey City and to Hoboken, you know, for a variety of things. You had big re residential rental, residential condos, um, and office. I think something that you said, Nick, is very valuable. That Lower Manhattan is always less expensive than Midtown Manhattan, and New Jersey was you know even less expensive. But with the economy th today, how do you how do you look at the Gold Coast, as they call it, of Jersey City and Hoboken? Uh, I'll go with sure. you first. You know, one, one of the interesting, one of the first deals I, I worked on at Prudential was a uh, an office building, large office building with with Nick. Mm -hmm. Actually, we closed. I think it was seven years ago. Yes, uh, about that long, and it was a uh, Harborside. Was, pardon me. Harborside. It was in Newport. It was and a Newport office center buildings. Right. One of the frac buildings. And uh, you know, great deal net lease with an investment grade credit. Um, we o o since then really haven't done a whole lot uh, over uh, on the Gold Coast, so to speak, in the office sector. Have been more active on the uh, residential side. Um, so it, you know, we've been out of that market a little bit uh, recently. But again, depending on you know the bar but and I'm, the situation. But I'm looking today, and I, I think r relating to the economy and everything. I know you've done. Well, there's, there's a couple of things. We have some office uh, loans over there, primarily with the Lafrax, but they're all single tenant credits. I mean, high credits. Now they are financial sector credits, so we're watching those to see uh, people like UBS, et cetera, and see what's going on in the financial sector world, as everybody is. But there is some talk that uh, as, as Lower Manhattan decreases in, in rental rate, that will affect what Sam Lefrak used to call the sixth borough, uh, and those and that will put some softness into that. Again, ours are credit deals on very long-term leases. From the residential perspective, and I've recently seen a couple of apartment towers over there, they seem to be holding up nicely. That was a, a lower cost alternative uh, to the Manhattan market, or, or as we used to think, and then some people told us, no, we just get twice as much space for the same amount of money. Um, that market is holding up well, but I think it will be affected by the financial sector in Wall Street and Lower Manhattan as well. You know, w with regard to, you know, you bring up twice as much space for the, the footage. Uh, a lot of, you know, the biggest problem today is you guys don't really do condos and the, nobody really wants to do a new condo and a lot of new condos are in trouble. Condos don't work as rentals, do they? Do they always work as rentals? Not at any fun. kind of reasonable yield, typically. For right. the tenants or the borrowers? <laughs> for the borrowers. <laughs> right. I'm, uh, for the tenants, the, the, I don't think deal. they, I mean, if someone came to you with a broken condo deal, for my audience, that means this is a condo that was planned and unfortunately do, during this time, not that many people are buying condos and there's a question, how would you, how would you look at that deal? Would, would you look at it, this is because now it's a stabilized property. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a condo, you know. What we're hearing from from some market participants is they're you know depending on where they are in the project they're trying to dial back costs a little bit to make it make a little bit more sense, um, but I think at the end of the day it's probably maybe it's the next owner that can make money on that deal as a multifamily. It's, so, it's so the basis is different, right? And right. I think the last time at least that that we I came across this in my career was you know early '90s when you've had some uh, failed condo projects uh, here in Manhattan that uh, you know basically turned back into rental projects and then. 
emerged as condos, uh, you know, closer to 2,000, and maybe we'll see a similar type of progression now. And the other thing that happened that was interesting in the last go-round is that a lot of those condominium buildings were purchased by public institutions, hospitals, universities, et cetera, and used for housing until they got to the point that the value rose enough to make sense you either know, as condos or other, other buildings. Speaking about that, how about, I mean, the, the biggest problem nationwide, especially in New York, because I've done a show where I had the four prominent healthcare leaders, is student housing. Is student housing, graduate housing. How do you look at that? Have you ever looked at any? Well, we've looked at student housing, not here in New York, but down in Philadelphia. It was another market that I cover. So as long as you're, I think, in or close to a major city and you've got a, a real base, a growing college, that it's a very good investment. We like student housing a lot. What about you? Uh, uh, again, you know, w when we uh, look at student housing transactions, it's primarily for our, our Fannie Mae program, and that's you know, for student housing that has a, a kitchen in the rooms. Uh, we typically want to be in major urban areas uh, with, you know, borrowers who do this for a living, and uh, typically with better, bigger schools, um, at better credit. Uh, on the general account, we, we really haven't done a whole lot of student housing transactions, but again, for that similar credit profile, we'd be interested in, in looking. Next. I would say since the 80s, it really hasn't been a significant focus for us. We've done some deals here and there. Prior right. to that, it was. Yeah, I would say this year we're starting to see some good opportunities, and we, we actually did execute on um, a portfolio of student housing uh, projects in SUNY, various SUNY campuses, um, and we're looking for, you know, adjacent to the campuses with an operator that knows what he's doing, and um, we actually like the product type. It fits well with our mission. With, with, a, with a couple minutes left, how long is this credit crisis going to last. Any idea? I'm going to start with Mr. Coppola. Um, I, I'm hearing that 09 is already written off and we're looking at mid-10, 2010. Nick? Uh, I think it's going to take a lot longer than, than anyone imagined. You don't run up what we ran up for seven or eight or ten years and expect it to uh, clear itself out. And the initial guesses were three or four months, then it became a year, and then it became a couple of years. So I think right. it's just going to be difficult for some time until there's stability in the markets, as we said earlier, pricing, uh, data, et cetera. But uh, good opportunities are going to present themselves, and e each of our companies will decide, are we staying in the market on a regular basis? Are we pausing here and there and, and waiting for better opportunities? But that remains to be seen. I think the, mar the commercial mortgage market has got a long way to go in terms of repricing, and, and there's going to be a contraction that will probably go until 2010, uh, similar to the early 90s. Uh, the entire size of the market, which is now approximately three trillion, you know, may go down 15 percent in terms of. So there's there's a, a way to go, and uh, I think probably uh, similar to Rick's view, we're we're talking about another year, year and a half before we can get out of it. Chris, I would have to agree, and I just think that the There'll be some money, and, I, and when money starts flowing again, I think that's when we're going to start getting out of it. But for right now, it doesn't seem you need some stability in the market. So in conclusion, I think all of you are lenders. You will continue to be lenders under conservative approaches with good borrowers, and people who want to come to some of the best insurance companies will have that opportunity. So I'd like to thank Chris Van Aken of Aegon, Scott Chisholm of Prudential, Nick Yankee of Northwest uh, Mutual, and last but not least, Rick Capola of TIA Cref. Next week, we talk about what's happening in Lower Manhattan. See you next week. Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, GVA Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, 
Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M and T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization.